Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy from beautiful Sunnyvale, California. We're finally getting into some summer here. Got the windows open and just got to love it when the weather gets beautiful. Today, we have a follow-up visit, one of the most popular guests. Jake Markham's a young man who's an elite swimmer and has had to deal with thoracic outlet syndrome uh, before we ever met him. Uh, fortunately, uh, Jake's dad is a physician. He's got a tremendously supportive family, but it was a real uh, trip that he went on from beginning to end. And now uh, Jake is with us again to share his recovery and how he's been doing in the year since we've seen him. So Jake, it's great, really great to see you again. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot uh, in between the times that I was on last, but um, it's always great to come and share my story and help people who have TOS. I think there have been several people who've commented on your video as well as your video um, that your family put up. Do you want to tell us that website? Yeah, so I, my, my family and I created a website called helpforthoracicoutlet.org, um, and it's kind of documenting my story. Uh, we have a documentary on there that goes from when I was first diagnosed, a little bit before from when I was first diagnosed to um, a little over a year, or a little under a year later, I won my uh, first ever junior national champion, and then uh takes me into college a little bit um and so on there we've um we have that documentary and we have um frequently asked questions i'm in the process of actually um creating a subset of the uh website that's just going to be for testimonials from people i've had a couple friends who are swimmers as well and they have been um they had tos and they had to retire so i want to have their testimonials I have an interview with another lady who had um, the arterial version of TOS on there. And then um, talking with my dad on there also, um, getting a physician's perspective. Um, I'm in the process of setting up an interview with two vascular surgeons also, um, just to kind of talk about the anatomical um, background of TOS and what's actually going on inside the body and the background on the procedures that go on. Um, so I got some big projects coming up with it, but um, again, it's helpforthoracicoutlet.org. Uh, please feel free to go and um, check out the documentary, check out the website. And it's a, if you have a very, questions. very nicely produced documentary. People love it. And uh, we've had people contact us since your first visit with us saying your story is very inspiring to them. So um, I'd like to walk you through a couple of big picture questions yeah. and I'll let you go and you can share because you're such a well-spoken person. So my first question is, in this recovery period after your surgery, after mm -hmm. learning to deal with life and athletics again, following yeah. the diagnosis, how do you know to control yourself? When does your body go too far and how do you deal with that on a daily basis? Yeah, um, it's definitely hard. Um, I've gotten to the point now where I'm a little over five years post-diagnosis. Um, I had four surgeries on it. Um, and I think the biggest part about it is just listening to my body. I've become so accustomed of, I, I, I have gotten to know my body a lot better since my diagnosis. Um, so I, as a, as a swimmer, I've been able to feel the way it felt before I was diagnosed versus how it feels now um, when it feels good, when it feels not great and just listening to my body about that. Um, and it's also very hard now because sometimes I think I'm okay. And I just kind of forget about it and take a step back and like, all right, right now I do something every single day before I go to practice that is going to help me be at an elite level in practice every day. And if I don't do that, maybe for a day or two, I'll be okay. But if I like forget to do it for a couple of days, then it's going to, it's not going to be okay anymore. And I'm going to have to go back and start over on my pre-treatment before practice, my post-treatment afterwards. Um, and so for me, it's, I have to stay on top of it every single day. So having somebody around me, like I work uh, very closely with my athletic trainers and every single day, them keeping me accountable is something that's important, but also remembering that for my own goals, there's a place that I want to get to. And if I'm not looking after myself every day, then I'm never going to get to that goal. And I've seen it happen multiple times, actually. Um, it's kind of like trial and error. 
where there was a there was a period of time i don't know a year ago where i thought i was okay and i just kind of got a little lazy with my rehab and uh went about a week without it had no issues in practice i was fine came into practice and had a really hard practice and what do you know didn't do rehab before it and it flared up so um i kind of learned my lesson um especially from like being an athlete i I have to do something every day that's going to maintain my body but just listening to it because i i have been i've become so in tune on how i feel that I can notice the tiniest difference and I'm going to know, all right, this is going to be an issue in practice or yes, it feels different, but I know what this different feels like. And I know what happens because of this feeling. And it's not going to be, it's not the end of the world. It's something that I can just deal with after practice. We'll do a little extra treatment. So it's, it's definitely remembering that it, it doesn't go away. Um, Mm -hmm. Uh, and just so you, you have days when you feel normal and then it's just oh, yeah. a great feeling to forget everything about TOS, right? Oh yeah. No, it, there, there are some days where it, it just completely slips my mind. I walk into the pool and I'm like, man, I feel great today. And I get in the water and I feel great. It just a couple days later, if I keep feeling like that, I'm not going to feel great. Um, and so, um, I guess just for me, making sure I'm doing that every day, but then also in my daily life, um, outside of athletics, knowing that, like, say I want to go, I want to be at a point where I want to reach up and grab something from the top, um, from the top shelf, knowing that that's something that's been hard for me in the past, (laughs) making sure that if my physician uh, gave me exercises to do, making sure that I'm doing those because I don't want to be able to not be able to reach up and grab this or not be able to carry something because my arm goes numb because I didn't do something that I needed to, to help my body recover. Um, so it's, it's not even an athletics, it's an everyday life that you have to, um, you have to maintain that and constantly be reminding yourself, Hey, it, it doesn't go away. It's something that's with me, but knowing how to work with that in life. Um, like I've had instances where I'm helping somebody carry something pretty heavy and my arm will go numb and I'll be like, well, what did I, I look back and say, what did I do? What did I do today? That's going to help me not have that happen. And I look back and say, okay, I didn't do this when I woke up. I didn't do this because I have certain things that I do when I wake up that helps loosen up that area every single day, just so I can go through my daily life. Mm -hmm. I know that I can't tighten my backpack super heavy or wear a super heavy backpack because my arm will go numb at some point. So doing something like I'll maybe loosen that up, take something out, an unnecessary textbook. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll go and actually loosen up this area. Every morning when I wake up, I loosen up this area because that was the part where uh, my vein was pinched and just kind of massage it a little bit, loosen it up so that I know functionally every single day in daily life, I'm going to be okay to reach up and grab something, carry something, wear a backpack. Um, So doing those every day. And then on top of that, when it comes to athletics for me, taking it to a whole nother level. It's interesting in uh, 1943, in the middle of World War II, there's a famous uh, neurologist, I believe Waddell, Uh, published a paper about military recruits, Mm -hmm. young, healthy men like herself, wearing backpacks and getting symptoms. It just reminded me of that. So you found this independently, but that is recognized in the literature. Yeah, Um, uh, it was very fascinating because the first time I felt it, I was um, was going to a meet, I think it was against LSU, and I was sitting in the lobby, or I was standing in the lobby of the hotel uh, ready, waiting to go up to my room and it was an overnight trip. So I had packed everything in a backpack, all my clothes, toiletries, my, uh, gear for the next day, uh, all of that, my backpack or my computer, all that stuff was in my backpack. And I was standing there and slowly, but surely I felt my arm start, start to tingle in my fingers. My arm start to fall asleep. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And then it happened again. A couple months later and i was like okay and i started to connect the dots and i'm like okay 
I can't put a ton of stuff in my backpack or that's going to be an issue. What can I do that's going to help that not be an issue in case there is some day that I have to carry something heavy? Um, so I was able to make that connection and then I've, I, I kind of tweak things. It's like a trial and error basis. I tweak things that I know is going to help. Um, what exactly do you tweak in terms of carrying a backpack for the, um, I ask because it's, not everybody we deal with is obviously an elite athlete, but you're living yeah. your daily life and having symptoms. And this is where it can be really helpful for a lot of our viewers. Yeah. So I, I kind of like, um, I know that releasing up here is something that's important for me up in my trap. I mean, your trap. Um, okay. Uh, I know that uh, this is just for carrying a backpack. I know that if I'm like when I'm going to a meet or something and I pack everything in my backpack, I will like massage this area on the way or I'll um, try to do something, put like a hot and cold cream to kind of loosen up that area. Got and it. then I especially work focus on just like rubbing around here in my pectoral muscle and releasing mm -hmm. that a little bit because I know that's where the strap is going to be. It's going to go over my trap and through my pec. And do you so, change the position of the straps? Do you do anything to modify? Uh, I don't wear them. I don't wear them tight. I wear them very loose um, mm. because I know that I would rather have the majority of the weight hanging right here on my trap than it would on the, um, front, the front of your shoulder. Exactly. So that loosens it up for me. It takes the weight more towards my back than it does right. the front. So then my arm doesn't really fall asleep then. Good. Now I'm going to interrupt here. I want to remind our viewers, uh, please hit the like button, subscribe. We need more subscribers. We're about 300 away from a thousand. And once we get to a thousand, Facebook allows us, I'm sorry, YouTube allows us a lot more latitude to reach out to other people. So ask your mom, your friend, anybody in your support group to get a subscription to us and hit that button at the end of subscription. So you'll know when we have a new show coming up like this one with Jake. Now, Jake, you had mentioned your training staff. I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you kind of a two-part question. Um, okay. Let's make it three parts. Number one, how much did they know about TOS? Number two, how much have you taught them? And number three, how much, if any, change have you seen from five years ago to now? Wow. Okay, that's a three-part. So I've had some trainers who have known a lot about TOS. And I've had some who knew absolutely nothing about it. Um, so I would, I'm going to start off with my first trainer in high school, um, coach TJ Bass. He actually tested me for TOS before sending me to the hospital. So he had, there was some arm test where I had to like hold my arm, make a fist, something like that. Uh, and he was able to tell that I had, he suspected I had TOS and it was kind of at that moment. He was like, all right, you need to go to the hospital. Um, and then I guess with him, we, a lot of the like rehab and treatment stuff, we kind of made up on our own. Um, mm -hmm. we, we would look at the symptoms and try to figure out a solution to the symptoms. I know for me, a lot of the times my arm would swell up and start turning a different color. And we were like, okay, how can we prevent that from happening? Or how can we decrease the swelling and limit the make the blood drain out of the arm properly so with that we began we began to a strap my arm and i would hang it up for 20 30 minutes at a time getting full flush um that's actually developed that's something that's a staple that i still do to this day mm -hmm. so five years ago i did it i still do it today um but it's evolved a lot more and that's come with working with different trainers I had a trainer at uh indiana knew kind of a little bit about tos but i had to teach them a little bit about things that i had done in the past um that is that helped me and hopefully if they have a, an athlete that comes through or they know somebody they'll be able to learn from my experience and what i knew worked for me and maybe suggest that work for somebody else um I would say the most progress I've made, and I guess I've used the word before tweaking of my rehab and treatment and stuff has come while I've been at Alabama um, and just trying new things. Um, I do a lot of work with the lacrosse, with a lacrosse ball on my pectoral muscle, hmm. making sure that that's loose. Um, you mean the pec minor? Yes. That's correct. Go ahead. 
um, there's uh, exercise that I do that opens up my thoracic cavity where I lay flat on my back with a foam roller between my spine and I hold my arms back here and just try to let them go all the way back as far as, far as I can. And sometimes we'll do it for two minutes at a time. Sometimes my arm will start to, this is an exercise where my arm actually starts to fall asleep. It'll fall asleep after a minute sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when it falls asleep, that's kind of when we stop. Um, but that's just focusing on opening up that area. Cause for me as a backstroker, my stroke goes mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. So I need to have as much flexibility and openness in this area. Um, we've, uh worked a lot with heating up the area using heat to loosen up the muscles um that's something i do every day before practice um and honestly in daily life if i knew i was going to do something if i had to carry something heavy if i was moving or um something like that i would honestly i would suggest doing that because for me the heat helps loosen up the area i know it's not going to be tight i know it's not going to pinch on anything mm -hmm. at that point um, and then after I've loosened up the area, obviously I massage it a little bit. Um, so we use a lot of heat. Um, and then now I work, uh, after practice, this is something that we introduced a couple months ago. I work with a device called a Mark pro, which mm -hmm. I you have like four different, I think it's electrodes, um, that you put on your arm, put one on your palm, one on your forearm, one on your bicep and one on your trap. And it uh, shoots electrical electrical pulses, um, basically stimulating the muscles in the area. And it for me, it helps get the blood flow out of my arm. And so that's something that I do every single day after practice with or without an issue. Um, and I've basically for my trainers, a lot of it has come with accountability, um, making sure that I that they know I need them to help me stay accountable every single day because I'm a college student. I, I'm 22 years old. Sometimes I forget. Um, sometimes I get a little cocky and I'm like, oh, I, I feel fine. But knowing, uh, having people around me who know this is what I need to do please help me stay grounded in what I'm doing and keep me accountable. That's something that was really important for me because if I didn't have that accountability, if I didn't have somebody there saying, Hey, like, I know you feel great, but you need to do this because this is what has happened. This is what will happen if you don't do it. So you've um, assigned somebody in the training staff that you have to report to a little bit there. Uh, so we have three trainers on staff. Um, all of them are very familiar with what, um, with TOS, thanks to me, uh, a little bit. Um, but uh, usually I find there's one trainer that I work with the most, and that's kind of the person I report to every day. Um, and they'll be like, okay, I want you to do this today. I want you to do this today. Uh, we're gonna try doing this exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something new, but we're gonna try it, see if that's gonna work out. Um, a lot of the new stuff we do is after I have an issue um we're like okay we take we sit down and we look back and we're like okay we've done all of these different things some of those are great but we're missing something here because you're not missing a day and something still happened what's something that we can add looking anatomically at the area um that we're missing and so that's when we kind of get a little creative we're looking at things and um but yeah i i work I work pretty closely with all of them, but there's usually one that I, um, that I work with on a daily basis and they help keep me grounded. Um, and then obviously I have my parents who always, every time I call them, they're like, how's your arm feeling? You know? Um, so they help me keep grounded too and, uh, keep me accountable because certainly there's many times where they see it and maybe my trainers don't see it where I'm getting not necessarily, um, where I start to get a little lazy and they can see it, uh, even from afar, uh, just by the way I talk to them. And, um, and they help, they definitely help remind me and they'd be like, Hey, like we saw what happened. Um, you know, we, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Great. Have you seen a progression of understanding or awareness of the disease among the people you've worked with? Definitely. Um, 
especially within, I would say, the athletic training community. Um, sorry. <coughs> Uh, we have um, every year we have student trainers that come and train underneath their undergrads that train underneath our um, our actual athletic trainers. And while they're taking classes, they learn about TOS. And every time they get to the point where they're learning about TOS, our main athletic trainer is like, hey, this is somebody who has TOS. Um, <laughs> and I've been like, uh, they have to do a project like I'm on three different athletes that they worked with um, talking about what's what, like what they're getting treatment for and all that stuff. And I think I've been uh, one of the projects like three or four times. Um, so I get to talk to them and sometimes I'll just sit there and we have three or four and I'll, I'll talk to them for about 20, 30 minutes about my experience okay. and things that work for me, things that don't work for me. And we want to cover this a little bit later, how you've taken this, real challenge and you've turned it into a positive for other people in the TOS community through your advocacy. I'll, I want to get to that later. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's very, that's fascinating to me. Uh, I want to address something a little to the side, which we both agree is a pretty big thing. And that is besides the physical signs and the physical treatment, the physical exercise. What about the emotional or mental health issues that go with TOS in your experience? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it could be pretty dark. Um, I know for me personally, <coughs> uh, it was, it was very hard. Um, because I know, uh, for me, thankfully I had people around me who could see, I I'm pretty bad at hiding my emotions. Um, and they knew that and they could see like if I was having a bad day or um, even if I was having a great day and making sure that I'm staying, keeping my highs. There's always a saying that we have um, in swimming during meets. Uh, that's something that I applied to my recovery was keeping my highs low and my lows high um, and kind of staying true to that. Um, nobody ever really talks about it. But it's, I mean, I remember the first night I, um, after getting home from the ER, I, w I tried to go to bed and I didn't sleep because I knew nothing about TOS. All I knew is that I had blood clots in my arm and I didn't know that clots are more likely to travel from your legs than they are from your arms to your heart and lungs. But all I knew is I had a clot that was, I don't know, a foot away from my, from my lungs, mm -hmm. my heart. And I was terrified if I went to sleep that my parents would walk upstairs and I wouldn't be there. Um, and I know now that that is a little more unlikely than it being in your legs. But I mean, I was scared because I knew nothing. Um, I mean, there's nights where uh, I'd go to bed and, you know, I wouldn't want to wake up because of the pain. I, it was so incredibly painful sometimes and uh i never really told my parents that maybe i should have um just so they knew i mean they knew what i was going through and they always always they were my rock through it um but it's hard um and i think something that's important is making, I mean, I talk about it, we're going to talk about it a little bit later is advocacy, but making sure that there's people around you who are going to keep your highs low and your lows high. And I think the most important part is your lows high. Um, because there's, I mean, those were the darkest days of my life so far. Um, I, I, there were times where I'd wake up and I'd throw my phone across the room because I didn't want to get out of bed because I felt so bad and the pain, I mean, there were times where the pain was so bad. I'd just be standing there and I'd start crying. Um, but I think knowing for me, and I, I hope that this can apply to everybody. I mean, personally, I'm somebody who's very goal oriented and driven, but I set a goal. And at first it was, to raise my arm above here. Then it was to raise my arm all the way up. You know, 
Um, obviously, I had a huge goal in the back of my head from the very start. I wanted to swim again at an elite level. Uh, I was told I would probably never do that again. Um, but I kept believing in myself and having those little goals at the time it's baby steps being able to crawl my hand up the wall like this was something that was huge milestone for me when i was able to do that um but yeah i had i had baby goals along with a huge goal but i had baby goals that helped stay me grounded because i had something that i always wanted to work towards and there were days i uh i was talking to coach bass a couple weeks ago uh, and I wanted to know his perspective because we worked very closely for about a year, a year and a half. Um, and I wanted to know kind of like, because he was one of my support group, kind of what he could see on a daily basis uh, with what I was going through. And he said, and I, I thought I was holding everything in and, um, you know, Obviously, people can see when I was upset, but there were days when I'd come in the training room and he, he he could see me walk in. He'd look at my arm. He'd look at me and instantly know that is not good. I'm having a terrible day. And he said a lot of times I would stand there with a smile on my face and say, hey, we're, we're OK. We're OK. Um, and I think that's something that's so important. I thank him every day. Um, I think you're blessed that he was there. Incredibly blessed. But, and I know some people aren't fortunate enough to have somebody like that. Um, but I think finding somebody, you know, um, and again, advocating Great for yourself, point. making sure people can listen because it, it is so hard mentally. Because I remember before I was diagnosed, I couldn't, I literally woke up in the morning and I could not lift my arm above here. That's when I knew something was not okay. And um, I was freaking out. I was freaking out inside. I was like, I'm supposed to go to practice this afternoon. I'm not gonna be able to swim, you know? Um, but, li but having those baby goals, being able to lift it up to here, being able to get up here, crawl up the wall. I think those are something that's incredibly important because if you don't have something that you're working towards, you can get complacent and just kind of accept the fact that this is how it's going to be. And I think in my case, if I would have accepted the fact I would have been, I would have just spiraled down a deep dark hole. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who are in a deep dark hole who have TOS, um, I encourage them to talk to somebody because that's if, so important. If I could paraphrase, you brought up three really big topics. The first one is um, understanding or knowledge of the disease. You're uh, applying for dental school now and you're deeply involved in science. And for you, it was obviously very important to get a name on this, to be able to open up Google and understand what was going on. And yeah. the second thing was you advocated for yourself. You had to do it pretty strongly. You had to believe in yourself, mm -hmm. but you also really created that support team around you. Obviously your parents have been a great support team, another blessing for you, but you yeah. made it more and you worked with coach Bass and you've worked with other athletic trainers now. Yeah. So uh, those three things, getting some knowledge of the disease, which yeah. then helps the self-advocacy and then building yeah. a support group. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was no literature out there that I could find, especially for an athlete. Um, but in general, I didn't know much. I tried to look up stuff. I didn't know much. And thankfully, there's people like you out here who are trying to advocate and give out information to people because it's not really well known. Um, and that's a large part of the reason why I create why my family and I created the website that we have because we want to give back to people and I don't want anybody to go through the same uncertainty that I had. Um, Cause for a long, a long period of time, it was like, I was in a train going down a tunnel and there was no light at the end of the tunnel because. But that sounds very passive the way you describe that. Yeah. And you weren't passive. Yeah. So, um, no, that's, that's one of the things also we advise patients is to move from passive 
to active. Don't let your doctors <laughs> or your care team put you on that train with oh, a yeah. light in a dark tunnel, which yeah. obviously you did. Yeah. That um, gaining, gaining control and knowing that you can fix things yourself and with a team. Yeah. And it really empowered you. Yeah. And definitely um, a large part about it is I'm, I made people listen to me. Um, I love, I love my high school coach. I got lunch with him last week. I had to make him listen and understand that, mm -hmm. Hey, when I say, I know my body better than anybody else. When I say, Hey, there is something wrong. I can't do this that I mean it. It's not because I'm trying to get out of something. Um, so making sure the, the people around you can listen and understand. And um, that's, I think that's hugely important because if you can't make those people understand you, you're not going to have a great support group and having a support group is something that's important. Right. They should, they shouldn't be a barrier for you. They should be a support, a exactly. forward, forward active uh, process for you. Now, exactly. Um, a, a slightly parallel to this, all of our viewers, uh, I just recently published a blog post about Major League Baseball, which we're a month, a month and a half into, and all the baseball players who have been affected by TOS. And I got down this seemingly never-ending pathway as I researched each player to find out there were three more and then three more and then five more. And to see in their individual story, some of what Jake has gone through, I think, you know, you've been really lucky. You're blessed with uh, your dad's a doc. A cardi you know, he works with a cardiac system. And so he understood this. He referred you to a really good surgeon nearby. You were very lucky. Um, but you've done a lot of it yourself. And when I looked at the stories of baseball players, I think there's growing awareness in the elite athlete category like you and like these, you know, amazing Major League Baseball players. How good do you have to be to be on a Major League team, right? And then any slight asynchronous painful problem with your body, their, their performance goes way down. And this is what they've trained their whole lives for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so factually it's interesting human behavior wise. It's interesting to see how the players, um, some of them got diagnosed and some of them didn't. And then um, to understand the, how this disease can come on anybody. Uh, all, most of our viewers are not major league baseball players. But we've yeah. done a lot of, you know, pitchers, some some professional pitchers who are quite famous and people like you. And um, I'm just I just really admire your strength, first of all, for getting through this the way you have in such a positive way and turned it into more positive for other people. So kudos to you. Thank you. Um, I would ask people go check out our most recent blog post. It's fascinating. It's truncated because I could not possibly cover every baseball player that's gotten this. But one of our goals here working with people like Jake is to help raise awareness so that these people who are trainers, not just for college, great college swim teams, but major league baseball teams that they recognize it earlier. Like, like your coach did for you. It's great that coach Bass found it early. Yeah. Definitely. So let's, let's shift now to the self advocacy part we were just talking about. And let's talk about how you've been reaching out to advocate for other people if you don't mind sharing and be a little immodest. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, something as important as advocating for yourself, but uh, something I've done is through my website, advocating for others. Um, I've had, in, I don't know, in the past month or so, I've had three or four people, parents, um, actual children who have had, who have been diagnosed with TOS and know nothing because they've stumbled across my website um, or they stumbled across a video with you guys uh, and being able to, I mean, obviously my, like my social media, I'm always open to talk to people um, who have TOS and let them know that they're not alone. But I had, um, I had a parent ask me what was the most important thing for me personally that I got from my parents because her son was going, was diagnosed with TOS and she didn't really know what to do. Um, so I, I told her the things that were most important for me going through it was my parents never, ever showing doubt. They never showed doubt. Um, my dad told me how it was. My mom was always encouraging. 
they never once said, you know, maybe you should just give up, you know? Um, so I, I said, be a rock, be there, be supportive constantly because there's going to be highs. There's going to be lows. Um, I had a, I had a girl in high school reach out to me a couple of weeks ago, diagnosed with TOS, uh, the exact Venus, exact same kind I had. Um, was she a swimmer by any chance? And she was actually. Um, and a lot of the ones who have reached out to me have been athletes. Um, but I've had a couple who are not athletes as well. And just talking them through the process, um, letting them know, hey, I had the same exact pain that you're having and it's okay. Um, I know I know what it is. And having somebody know that somebody else has gone through this and they've gotten through it, um, they've been successful with it, they know what you're going through and hearing them is incredibly important. I never had that. I wish I had that. Um, but I didn't know anybody who had TOS. So being able to give back to people in the community and letting them know, hey, like, I, I know exactly what it's going through and I'm here and I'm going to listen to you and everything you're saying is valid because, you know, I've experienced it myself. And sometimes people need to know that. Um, so I've been incredibly humbled to be able to help people like that. Um, and I'm always up, open to help. I love um, talking with you guys and advocating and letting people know, like, these things are okay. But you can also live with this and not let it define your life. Um, you know, I TOS is a huge part of my life. Um, it's given me a platform to share and help others, but it doesn't define me. I define myself and what I do every day. Um, so I encourage other people who have TOS who are listening, like it, it does not define you. It's something that you have, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't define your story. You, you get to define your story. And um, I encourage everybody, no one to give up because you, like, you can get through this. There are people out there who will help. There are people out there who will listen. Um, and I think that's important. Those are very powerful words. That's, you have a very good way with words. Thank you. Just to embarrass you. That's, that's really great. But, it, uh, you know, I imagine that a young man of your age who works so hard at one thing, at the swimming, that when that gets threatened, that you may not be able to do it so easily or at all. I imagine that was part of this tremendous uh, mental challenge. Yeah, definitely was. I um, that would, that was something that, that's something I learned is swimming at, up until that point in my life had defined me. Um, I had it taken away, and I had to figure out who I was as a person and how I was going to function with the idea of not being a swimmer anymore. Uh, fortunately. I was able to continue swimming and have been able to do it at an elite level, but I had to, I had to do soul searching during that period of time and figure out who I was, who I wanted to be. Um, because I didn't want to be just a swimmer and I didn't want to be somebody who just has TOS. I wanted to be my own Jake Markham who makes my life and defines it my way. Um, and that's something that helped me go through this whole process because I knew that, TOS doesn't define me. Like I'm going to, I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to get through this. Um, cause I don't want it to hold me back from what I'm, what I want to do in life. That's great. That's great. And, um, it's hard for me to draw a parallel, but I guess if someone took TOS away from me, when I know my team and the people we meet, um, we're very, very much into this making progress. We've been doing this for 25 years. And uh, there are good days and bad days. I don't have to have pain like you had to suffer through or those fears of, you know, will I wake up tomorrow? <laughs> it's different, but it is a big part of um, who I am personally and who my team is. We all really care a lot. And if someone threatened to take that away, it would be really challenging. So, mm -hmm. you know, your story of, of how you had to fight through this and uh, the way you described that it's a part of you, but it's not you. 
as mm-hmm. uh, to me, it's very inspiring. I think that can help a lot of our viewers and patients. I certainly hope so. That's uh, been able to been given this platform. I just want to be able to give back and help those and give somebody else out there a little bit of hope. So help for thoracic outlet. Uh, .org is the website. Yep. And mm-hmm. can you share another few uh, uh, examples of how you're helping people through the website? Yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm creating a, I have frequently asked questions on there um, where people can ask questions and we'll respond to them on the website. Um, and then also creating a testimonial page where there are people who are uh, a majority, a majority of them are athletes. Yes. But I do have some people in the works who are non-athletes and kind of giving their story there. It's going to be a written portion of the website. It's not going to really be interviews. There will be a couple, uh, where I actually go in person and interview the patient. Um, but it's going to be a testimonial talking about their own experiences, what they have found that's worked because I want it to be a resource for people to find things that are going to help them and find hope because there's other people out there who are going through this. Um, and these are some things that ha- have helped. I, I had a friend who had TOS and she asked me, Hey, what are things that you did to help? I gave her a list of things that I had done. She came back to me a couple months later, we checked in and she was like, you know, I tried to do some of these things, but they didn't work for me. So I found something else and this works for me. So I want it to be a resource for people. Um, so I'm in the process of working on that. And um, I've been in contact with a couple different people about uh, getting their written testimonies and sharing that and uh, putting it up there because I want people to be able to look there and say, there's a bunch of people who have gone through this. These are some things that helped. These are some things that didn't help. This person's going through exactly what, I, what I'm what i going through. They feel the exact same way I'm feeling. How did they get through it? Um, so just being able to help people through that and seeing, okay, there's things that help and things that don't. Um, because it's very, very much, I mean, my experience is very much trial and error. Um, and so I, I want my website to just be a resource for people. That's great. And, and you're just demonstrating how you're combining the emotional with the physical, with the scientific part of it, that people need a lot of components to move forward yep. as you've done. Yep. So that, um, yeah, the testimonials, no. the people saying, look, someone else has, has been here too. Yeah, that really helped. exactly. That's great. Now, where are you right now with school? Why don't you share with people what you're doing as we talked about a little bit backstage? Yeah, so uh, I graduate in the December of 2023. So I have one semester left to take. Um, and as of tomorrow, I'm applying to dental school. Um, so I'm super excited about that and kind of seeing, uh, where my journey goes from there. But, um, that's where I'm at academically wise. I have five credit hours left to take. I got a biochemistry class and a microbiology lab. So excited to get those over with. Um, but yeah, I'm in the pro I'll just be kind of hanging out this summer, waiting to see if I hear back from schools about dental school. That's great. Well, we have full confidence in you and uh, I'm excited to hear when you get into one of your best schools. That'd be very exciting. And uh, yeah, biochemistry is just one of those classes you have to survive. I remember that in organic chemistry. Yeah. And, uh, yeah right. So you, you pick some hard ones there. Yeah. Um, if it's okay with you, I would like to field some questions from some of our viewers. Of course. You can share with them. That'd be great. Herb. All right. All right. So this first one, Larry Schmidt. Hi, Larry. I'm a massage therapist with a client suffering from TOS caused by craniocervical instability or atlanto-occipital instability. This is where the base of the skull joins the upper cervical spine. It's a very complex sliding and twisting mobile joint, but it can be unstable. I don't know a lot about this condition. Um, And Larry asks, what can I do as a a body worker to help her? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the good question. Let's start off right off the bat. Um, Jake, I don't know how much if you've heard much about craniocervical instability. I, I haven't heard much, so I'll kind of leave that to you to explain. So uh, if I understand correctly, Larry, and you can post another question, I think one of the concerns is that we get compression of the internal jugular veins in some people. 
because the transverse process of the atlas, the first cervical body, mm -hmm. can compress those veins. I, I may be off in that, but if I'm correct, um, it's one of the choke points we talk about where the, the blood doesn't drain from the head and neck back to the chest easily. Just like when you get a blood clot, in Jake's case, it was right arm, um, the blood doesn't drain back. And mm -hmm. that creates all kinds of situations with venous congestion. And um, there's a guy in Italy who more than a decade ago suggested that multiple sclerosis, where we still don't know the causes, that it may be due to this kind of venous congestion. And just making it fit TOS, uh, because I don't know much about cranial cervical instability, um, sorry to say. But if that is true and it causes some venous congestion, then we look at that. Uh, some of the more progressive people in the field of TOS do worry about even congestion of the veins without a blood clot, something called McCleary syndrome. But Larry, if you want to add some more details, I'm glad to discuss it with you. And thank you for the question. TAMS 1212. Thank you, Jake, for sharing. I think I'll have to come to the USA for proper diagnosis or just to rule it out. I live in Canada. It's really hard to get good help here in Alberta, Canada. So um, again, I'm gonna reiterate this, Jake, you had to really build your own team. Mm -hmm. You had people who had different levels of understanding of the disease, but you prioritized and advocated for yourself. Yes. Okay. And we have people from Canada like this who they're in a system that deals great with a lot of stuff, but not with these unusual cases. <clears throat> so what kind of advice uh, and emotionally, as well as making a plan to get to the right doctors, could you advise for TAMS 1212? Yeah, so I think something that's important um, is if, obviously, I mean, I'm a Canadian citizen myself. Um, I've never lived in Canada, but I'm a dual citizen. But I know a little bit about the healthcare system there. I think something that's important is sitting down. This is something that I was fortunate enough to have my parents do for me. And they did this overnight. Um, but I think something that was important was they went through and they made a plan and they researched the physicians. So I think um, if you plan on coming to the US and uh, looking for a proper diagnosis, I would highly suggest um, doing the research on what are kind of the specialized places that specialize in TOS. Uh, personally, I'd recommend my own, uh, my surgeon, Dr. Fugit. Um, he's based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, did a phenomenal job with me. Um, and I think from the emotional standpoint, having a physician who understands, um, he was that person who gave me hope and i knew that he could say that because he was the one who was doing the actual procedures on me and he would tell me hey this is going to be we're going to be okay post post op he'd be like hey we were successful everything's going to be okay and he gave me hope um and i was very fortunate to have a good relationship with him so i think uh, doing research on the physicians um come prepared come with a detailed list of this is what I am. This is what I'm feeling. This are, I do certain things and these are my symptoms. Um, because the more information, the better, um, it's going to help the physician come to a diagnosis earlier. Um, I also suggest, um, I lost my train of thought coming with a detailed list. Um, and also do research on, what your symptoms are so you can come with an idea of saying hey it could be a couple of these things this is what i've done my research these are my symptoms um and then let the physician run tests obviously and um hmm. come to a good understanding but those are kind of my coming up with a good plan is a is a great place to start um and then if if you plan on staying in canada making sure I, I honestly i do the same thing and um if you come across a physician that's not um that doesn't quite understand tos to a certain extent that maybe a doctor in the u.s would understand more do come with symptoms come with a list of things that you think it could be based off of your level of symptoms um and give them an idea um because I know some physicians, they'll look at the symptoms and 
they'll look it up and be like, okay, it could be this and they'll rule it out. Um, so come in with as much information and know that, um, know that if they don't come up with a diagnosis, it's okay. You just got to keep, keep trying, um, and keep advocating for yourself and saying, Hey, there's something not right. Some, and find somebody who's going to listen to you. I think that's something incredibly important. And, and I would like to add some to our discussion here. Uh, number one, contact us at tosmri.com. We have a contact us page and we can give you a whole series of specialists in a geographical region. So unfortunately, Jake's parents had to go and search it themselves. We now can provide that list if you contact us. Uh, number two, what Jake's talking about, about having your knowledge ready. And if you get a doc who says, well, TOS, I don't know. You sometimes, we find that a lot of our patients, surprisingly, uh, just say thank you to the doctor and go on to another one. If your doc is experienced with TOS and they say you don't have TOS, that's valuable. If they're not experienced with TOS, then all bets are off. And again, an example of Jake's advocacy, your self-advocacy. This is one disease where you really have to stand up for yourself in a polite way. But we know many patients who have come from doctors who have said, well, it can't be TOS because I, I don't know. It just doesn't look like it. Um, don't don't accept that. you got to stand up for yourself. Uh, again, going to the right specialist helps, and we can help with that. Another choice, um, there are kind of coordinated TOS programs, like in Massachusetts General Hospital with Dean Donahue or Ying Wei Lum, who's going to be a guest of ours soon here at Johns Hopkins, uh, where they have a team working together, which, in my opinion, is essential for TOS. Uh, Jake, you're lucky because your dad has such highly specialized medical training, and he worked with Dr. Fugit, who's written at least one paper I know of, but has a very good reputation for this. So that's a team. And then you have your trainers. You have a lot of people working with you. And that's really critical uh, coming from Canada. And I'll make a comment without knowing much about the Canadian system. I don't want to insult anybody or step beyond my bounds from a lot of patients. What we've heard is there are not a lot of TOS specialists in the Canadian system. Sometimes that just happens. There are cities in this country that there's not an experienced TOS specialist. Again, self-advocacy. If a doctor says, I don't do this much, then when they say it's not TOS, that doesn't mean anything. So advocate for yourself with resources like Jake or us. So I hope that helps you uh, get started. We're glad to talk to you. Again, go to our website, tosmri.com. The last menu over says TOS education. It'll also have a contact us page in there. And we look forward to hearing from you, hopefully. Thanks, Jake. Main focus. I have neurogenic TOS for 20 years without surgery. I have sensations of something stuck in my throat, strangulation, chest pressure with activities that typically flare TOS. Are these symptoms TOS related? Uh, I'm gonna start this off, Jake. Um, thank you for the question. We're not giving specific medical advice here. So all these things we'll talk about will be general, okay? But definitely again, contact us and we can either do a consultation or get you to the right people. In general, um, in broad terms, some people with TOS do get chest pain and pressure. There are many different forms of TOS. And um, I mentioned a guy in 1943, that was one type where people had, um, young men were wearing military backpacks and got symptoms. And there's like 25 or 26 of these described in the literature over 200 years. So many different forms of this. And on the other side of the coin, there are many different causes of chest pain or chest pressure. Could be any number of things, including heart disease. So. Hopefully you've seen a doctor about that. Um, Jake, I don't want to let you get too involved in this because it's, uh, I just want to be careful with how we handle this. Again, we don't yeah. give out individual, you know, medical advice over the internet like this, but we're glad to talk to you. So I'm going to, I'm going to defer on that one for you, Jake. Uh, can we see another question, Herb? Ah, there we go. Same person, main focus. Uh, what diagnostics are best for worsening TOS symptoms when I've had TOS for 20 years 
and how to present that diagnostic test to the work comp insurance company as useful. Um, Jake, you had ultrasound. Yes. Uh, so the way I had my testing done was an ultrasound. That was my initial diagnostic. Um, I had blood tests done originally to uh, rule out rhabdomyolysis. Um, and then I had an ultrasound done. Oh, I think I had way, done rhabdomyolysis is when your muscles uh, break down from massive exertion and it can be a problem. Just, yeah. So I, I, I had a teammate who had rhabdo. And so we initially thought that that's what it could be. But then after the blood test came back negative, we, were, we came to the realization rhabdo would most likely appear in both arms. So um, I had an ultrasound done then, and that showed the clots um, and showed blood flow not going, not going in or out. Um, so that was my main way of testing that had uh, venoplasty done uh, to kind of look at the veins. I think Which that's is when they should. used a balloon to yeah. open up the vein. Um, I had thrombolysis done. Um, a, ve a venogram also. I think that's the one where they shoot the dye in, where they can get a big picture Correct. of blood flow. Um, those those are kind of the different uh, diagnostic techniques and tests that I had done on myself personally. Now, that's a kind of workup because you had a, a vascular form mm -hmm. of TOS. And actually, in young athletes like yourself, healthy ones who do a lot of overhead, uh, that's called effort thrombosis or Paget Schroeder, but mm -hmm. venous TOS, where you have an abnormality in the vein, like a scar, and then the blood clot forms and creates the symptoms that you see. Mm -hmm. But underlying that, while the ultrasound showed the blood clot, it started with the damage to the vein, mm -hmm. which started with the collarbone and the rib getting too close together as you're doing this thousands of times. Yeah. So now main focus has said that he or she has neurogenic TOS. So we would tend not to use ultrasound in that situation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm, I'm biased. I think what we do is great. The MRI shows, I think, everything we need to know right now about TOS. Some people will tell you that TOS is a diagnosis of exclusion, especially the neurogenic type. And that you just do tests to look for other things. But that is not true. The medical literature says it's not true. And I say it's not true. And I've got a decent amount of experience with this. So we believe that a test like ours, we obviously have pride in what we do, is the best way to assess what is going on underneath. What's the anatomy? What does the plexus look like? What's pressing on it? What changes when you move your arms? Is there accompanying disease of the cervical spine? Do you have abnormal muscles or extra muscles? We can see all that. So I think uh, by far the MRI exam, as we do it, is a great test for helping your clinician who's found the symptoms. Okay, And to reiterate what Jake, uh, what Jake described for vascular, either arterial or venous, that's a more typical workup where you look for a blood clot first and after thrombolysis, where you dissolve that, then you look at the vein underneath it to see if it's damaged. And if it is, <clears throat> well, you can do a plasty on it, a venoplasty where you put in a balloon catheter and you stretch that scar so it's open. But really it came about for a reason, the reason being something outside the vein that compressed it enough times and damaged it. And that situation with venous TOS even, I think MRI can be tremendously helpful, but it's not the first point in a workup as Jake so aptly described. So thank you for the question. I hope that's helpful. Uh, Tams1212, hi. Um, I want to come see Dr. Worden. That's nice. Thank you. Um, if I can say this, Herb and I have dealt with a lot of people from Canada, and they're all so nice. So uh, more, more is even better. Um, uh, just a month ago, I started seeing a chiropractor. He has a master's in neuroscience from the Carrick Institute in Florida. That's good and told me from getting scans and physical testing that I have arterial TOS. Um, again, we can't do something specific here. I would say contact us, as I mentioned before, but in general, arterial TOS usually presents with an aneurysm in the subclavian artery. It's up here. A doc can usually feel it by palpating and feel a pulsatile mass. And when that forms a blood clot, that blood clot can break off and block the arterial flow to the arm, 
I never see those cases because appropriately they should go directly to an ER. Now, just having an aneurysm doesn't mean you have arterial TOS yet. Um, this is something we could discuss in detail. I, again, don't want to be diagnosing. Um, here, an added note, I'm going for an arterial ultrasound in a few weeks. I hope something will show up. It's been three years. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is where you advocate for yourself. Reach out to us. Let us get you to speak to some other doctors who are experts in the field. And um, you need a second opinion at least. I think that's worth pursuing a second or a third opinion. Many of the docs we work with and other people, physical therapists, will do virtual consults. So you don't necessarily have to travel here. But we can help you with that if you contact us. All right. So another question. Ah, thank you uh, for main focus. Thank you. And reach out to us. Hi, Angela. How many and which scans put together would be equivalent to the Nia Vista MRI? Um, Jake, not really a question you can answer. I'm sorry. Um, they're with us. Um, so we have, we have one study that involves multiple sequences, but it's done within 45 minutes of scan time. And we've seen other patients recently, I had a patient from Southern California, have seven or eight scans to try to duplicate that. I, I would just say I, I wouldn't want to sit in a scanner for three or four hours with eight scans. Um, this is a field where radiologists can work with their technologists and create these studies that show what they need to see. And then the radiologist needs to understand the disease process and what to look for. So it's a team effort at that level. But then I work with surgeons around the country. They'll know I'm always bugging them, call them. Like I asked Jake a lot of questions. I hear the same thing with docs around the country. Hey, this patient I did a scan on, what did you find? And we always try to get better. So you don't want to have someone who has to do four scans or three scans to get this info. They either have a protocol like we do that's designed for this disease, or you should look somewhere else. I'm sorry to say. You don't want a radiologist just shooting in the dark. Get me a thousand pictures. Maybe one of them will show something. No, that's not the approach. All right. Um, can we have another question, Herb? Please. Thank you, Angela. Okay. So that's that's it for questions. So, Jake, um, at this point, I'm going to ask you, maybe in the future we can get uh, Coach Bass on with you. Yeah. That would be fascinating. I'd like to give him credit when you told your story with us originally. Boy, he was on top of this. And I think yeah. he's lucky to be in that position given what had happened. Definitely. Um, I will definitely reach out to him. Uh, he's currently the head athletic trainer for Brigham Young University, BYU. So um, I, I talked to him. He teaches an anatomy class there and he actually told he asked me for permission to share my story with uh, a class there. Um, but yeah, I definitely I'll reach out to him and hopefully we can get him on because he can show a lot of um, he can talk a lot about everything that I went through from his perspective, which is a very cool perspective to look at. You know, you're such a great success story. I know you're not 100%, but, you know, to be at the cutting edge of where you are, your level of competition, and to be pushed down like this, and to come back with all the emotional as well as physical challenges, it's just really a great human story that I hope inspires a lot of our viewers. You know, your attitude is so positive. We, All of us here, we really appreciate that. When we say, oh, we're going to have Jake on, everybody on the team is excited. <laughs> so um, I want to leverage that into, you know, meeting these people who are in positions where they can help spread it. And, you know, then we help save other athletes like you who mm -hmm. are at the top of their game, but something happens. So, um, you know, we, we always reach out when we see a new baseball pitcher diagnosed with TOS. We always reach out to the team trainer and mm -hmm. they rarely respond because I'm sure when you're a major league baseball team or a high level college you know, you're too busy and uh, you have to shield yourself. Yeah. But with stories like yours, hopefully we can spread it among the athletic community. I sure hope so. Members in particular. So um, we're excited for you for dental school. Uh, when do you start hearing from dental schools after you submit in the next couple of days? How long does um, it take to hear back? They start to send out interviews in late summer, early fall, I believe. Um, and then I think the acceptances roll out in December. So 
Oh. Hopefully, fingers crossed that I, I'll get an interview early on. Um, I feel like that's going to be a strong suit for me. And hopefully, we'll see where it goes from there. But I should be hearing back in about December. That'd be great. And it would be great if you can keep us updated here so we can let people know. For sure. Uh, thank you again for your time. Of um, course. Really appreciate not only the quality of what you say, but how um, how welcoming you are to helping other people. So, again, your website is? Uh, yeah, so my website is helpforthoracicoutlet.org. Um, please feel free to go out there, um, look it up, watch the video on there. There's, I think there's three or four videos on there right now. Um, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them in the frequently asked questions and uh, I'll respond to them. But um, yeah, helpforthoracicoutlet.org. Um, hopefully it can help somebody out there who's, uh, who's watching this. Awesome. Uh, we're going to talk to our viewers right now. Please remember to subscribe. Please remember to like because these algorithms help us get more of these uh, eyeballs on TOS stuff. And we all want to help the people who don't know they have TOS yet. So we want to raise awareness. So hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit that little arrow or the bell next to subscribe so that you always hear about upcoming studies we have. We do have, uh, thank you for the timing, uh, Dr. Yingwei Lum, very experienced TOS surgeon at Johns Hopkins. I had trained part of my time there. And uh, he's a progressive guy, a young guy who's very sharp. And we really look forward to having him on. I think uh, people will learn a lot from him. And so we can't wait to introduce him. And that's July 11th. So again, um, Jake, thanks for being here. Love seeing you. I'm thanks Dr. Scott Worden. I'm the TOS guy. And we have these talks regularly. Come to our website, tosmri.com or go to toseducation.org, who sponsors a lot of our videos. And thank you all for attending. Again, we'll see you soon.